Okay, so this is a really exciting interview today because I'm here with my special guest, Ken Hardison. And there's a very good reason why I believe you're going to want to find this uh, information particularly interesting because Ken has twice sold a seven-figure practice and uh, he's going to have a lot of amazing insights on how he did that. So, Ken, first, it's uh, it's great to have you here sharing your awesome insights. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So, Ken, let me ask you first. I mean, I, I, I want to kind of go back to the beginning. You, uh, If I heard that right, you had just lost a big case to a TV lawyer. Your practice wasn't going well. And years later, you kind of turned it around and became massively successful. Can you just kind of tell us, what happened and what was the biggest change that had to happen for you to kind of achieve this new success? Yeah, well, well, I graduated in 82 and I left, started a solo practice and then I went with the uh, oldest firm there in the town. I was in a small town, about 10,000 people. Mm-hmm. And uh, the older guy there, uh, it started the firm in 1929, so it was like the oldest, most established firm in town. And the old, the old the little guy was getting ready to re- retire. He just didn't want to go to court anymore, so they started associating me on cases. And then they finally, after about a year, they said, once you just come on, we'll make you a partner. So in 83, one year out of law school, I was made a partner, uh, uh, which was a pretty big deal back then because you just didn't walk in and make partner. Um, right. But but I was working my butt off and uh, because that's the way I've always been taught. That's the way I was raised. You, know, you work harder. You go, you know, you just work harder than everybody else. You, you'll be, them, you know, which is not true. I have learned that the hard way, but it's not true. Uh, and we can talk about that later. But that is the furthest from the truth. But uh, so they did not have a big PI practice. In fact, they had just been doing defense work and transactional work at state. Had a big estate practice, big real estate practice, and I built up. Uh, pretty lucrative little personal injury practice there, and my practice grew each year, and from '83 to about '92, '93, and then it just started leveling off. And I and, and I started looking at the numbers, and, uh, and I was doing good. I mean, I was probably back then I was netting about two hundred to two hundred fifty thousand in nineteen eighty eight, uh, ninety. It's not mm-hmm. bad money for town, 10,000 people, I mean, you know. But uh, I was, I was always been a guy that looked at numbers, and I was looking at the numbers, and they were just kind of flattened down. Every year I'd go on like, I don't know, 5, 10, 15 percent, you know, things like that. Nothing great, but, you know, steady growth. And I was doing no advertising. I was just in the phone book, like every other lawyer. And I did a little bit of cross selling, uh, with letters, but other than that, and this word of mouth was really the big deal. So, uh, you know, I began to wonder what the hell was going on because I was getting, you know, I've been practicing almost 10 years, so I was getting better. I was getting better verdicts. I tried a lot of cases. I was doing a general practice back then. I was doing criminal. I had a pretty good criminal practice. Uh, I was doing uh, some social security here, and I was doing the wall of wreck cases. I was doing... Uh, Actually, I was doing some government contract work. I had this guy, believe it or not, I used to play poker, a weekly poker game. This guy was a government contractor, and he was like one of the most successful men in town. And uh, one night we were playing poker, and he said, I want to hire you as my owner. I said, I don't know a thing about government contract work. He said, I'll go, associate, I'll go get a guy from Philadelphia. He'll train you, and I'll buy all the books, and you'll learn it. He said, I want somebody to go fight. He said, I'm tired of my lawyer. The lawyer I'm using from Raleigh, which is a big town, about an hour away. He wants to settle every damn thing. He's not a fighter. I want a fighter. And so I said, okay. So I started doing that. So I traveled all over the country. I was doing hourly work. And uh, it was okay. And I, then I was doing other stuff. But I got to this point and uh, I had two partners. And uh, I, I started telling them, so we got to do something. I'm going to figure this out, you know, whatever. So anyway, Going, I, I did a lot of DWIs, DUIs, whatever you want to call them. And I got to court one day, and I can't remember the guy's name. Just call it Joe. Him walking in the courtroom with a cast on and crutches. And I said, well, I have to Joe. He said, oh, man, I got T-boned by this. Uh, I don't even remember what kind of truck. Some kind of big truck. So I'm thinking, that's going to be a great case. I said, well, you know I do those cases. He said, yeah, I know you do. He said, but I hired this guy off the TV because that's all he does. And I figured, you know, and I, I was just so devastated, you know. Um, 
didn't try to talk him out of it because I just that's not my way I do business. I mean, you know. Um, right. I go back. I go back and I, I think about it, and I said, uh, "Guys on TV, I know this guy. He's never tried to catch smart marketer, smart guy, a nice guy, but he just didn't have a real grip. It was more like a meal than a guy that really knew how to try cases." So I brewed on it for two or three weeks. I sat down with my partners. I said, uh, you know, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta start marketing. We gotta start advertising. I said, I don't really know how, but I'm gonna learn how. And they said, no, it's not professional. We're not gonna do it. Um, and so we were at odds with each other. Um, probably for the next 12, 18 months. And finally I just decided, you know, and it was so funny, you were seeing a big surge of guys on TV, and a lot of the lawyers, we sat back in the live law library while we were waiting for our cases, you know, while I was doing criminal law. And they're all about there moaning and groaning and bitching and grafting. And I said, well, you guys can do all that you want to. I said, I'm going to do something about it. I said, I don't know what yet, but I'm going to do something. So anyway, so I made a last-ditch effort. I went to a couple of seminars on marketing, read some books, and I went to my partner and I said, this is, you know, I think we got to do something. And they said, no, we're not going to do it. So I left, and I started my own firm in uh, September 1996. I took uh, one associate and uh, three staff, and we worked out a deal. It was actually a very good split up. Um, and I worked out our fee arrangements and everything, and everything worked fine. But uh, so what I did, I was already been doing this. I'd go around to anything I could find, or read anything, and then I started traveling. And I got what I what I found to be very successful lawyers all over the country, and I found that they love to talk, just like what I'm doing now. You ask me one question, I just rambling all. <laughs> lawyers, lawyers, lawyers love to talk. They do. They love to tell you how good they are, and how successful. And if you're not competing with them, they'll give away some secrets. Um. So I went back and uh, started doing it, and I was working eighty, hundred hour weeks, and trying to build it up, and started doing a little bit of TV to a a group that where you pay a bunch, you know, pay money, and you got four or five lawyers, and you get every third call, every fourth call. Started doing something, actually put together a website, which was very archaic. Uh, I'd be ashamed of it today, but, you know, back then, nobody in the whole city that I was in had a website. Um, and started doing certain things. Um, and then, so that was my first aha moment. But then when I, when I found out was that, you know, the, the more you grew, it just got so uncontrollable because I didn't have a case management system. Um, you know, uh, uh, had very archaic computer system. Uh, they won't tie together, you know, just very, I would say, backwards. And no systems in place, no checklists, nothing. It was just kind of, you know, just practice. You had a file there. And I think I, the biggest thing I had was like some client called. I had a blue piece of paper. If it was a court date or something, I had a pink piece of paper in the file. And we had some kind of archaic. A particular system for court dates, like a, a, you know, just everything was very archaic and very um, not very very systematized. And I read this book by Michael Gerber called uh, The E Myth, and that was my second aha moment. I read that about 1997, the end of 1997, and that was I was having this tremendous growth, but I didn't know how to handle it. And uh, we went out and hired some people to help us, and they didn't know what they were doing either. And so did I finally just did it myself and hired a, a girl who had been working for one of these TV lawyers to come in and work with me and paid her a lot of money and, and figured out how they had it systematized. And, uh, and we just kept doing different things. I made a lot of mistakes because... Most there was no real marketing events for lawyers. It was more of going to other businesses uh, like um, uh, um, a big deal. I was a big Dan Kennedy follower, so I went to right. all his information, and I read a lot of Jay Abraham and uh, Caples and Ogilvy. 
So all the big masters in, in, in marketing, I just took it, tried to apply it to, to law, and sometimes it worked, and sometimes it didn't, and then sometimes we got restraints because of the ethics and, and things like that. But we kept pushing along, and uh, uh, I went out and borrowed it, every bit of money I could borrow, and I started working on TV big time, and, uh, uh, and really very centric focused on client service. So we were real big on client service. Uh, and that was kind of like our uh, differentiator. We never talked about how much money we could get people. Or, and I kind of, in that time, I, I in 98, I kind of just quit doing everything. But Adrian Law, I decided just to specialize. Even though you can't say you're specialized, you can say you're concentrated. And so we did injury work, disability work, workers comp. And that was it. And uh, we just kept popping it. And then in 2002, six years later, five years later, I ended up with 13 lawyers and 47 staff. And I had like five satellite offices and two manned offices. And I think uh, when I sold it in 2010, uh, we had about 55 staff and about 13 lawyers and about Three man offices and like four satellite offices, virtual offices is what I call them. You know, yeah. um, well done by it, the way. Yeah, but I had it very systematized. It took a lot of work. I'm not gonna lie. But once we got it all done, and we, we used it, we, we we tried two or three different case management systems. We finally found one we liked, and uh, we really did a lot of training on it, um, and we uh, we. Uh, we just did a lot of things. We were very progressive. I was very open-minded to change. Uh, in fact, they used, to, they used to joke about it. Two things used to joke about me. One was uh, he's got a process for going to the bathroom. <laughs> you know, because like, <laughs> I, I got man, I got a client service manual. I had, you know, uh, had a uh, associate's manual. Um, we used to have meetings, and I'd sit there and teach them how to manage their staff. And we ran reports, and we have, you know, we have monthly meetings with the staff, and we we were very progressive, uh, and we were very open about what we were trying to do, and uh, and I think that's one of the biggest deals. I had a vision. I actually laid it out when I went on when I decided to go go all in and borrow the money. I actually set out a five year plan of where I wanted to be, and I was really like real close. I can say I was exactly there, but I was like eighty percent there. Um, so that was the deal. I mean, it, uh, I know it's a long answer, but that's that's my story. Um, well, that's excellent. I'm, I think there were a couple changes. Just to recap, kind of that you mentioned, you had the the aha of having to learn marketing, then having to learn systems, having a vision. Those are those are all kind of really big points. Uh, just to kind of change up a little here, um, you know, I hear so many attorneys they're working these eighty hour work weeks desperately trying to reach 2,000 billable hours. And, you know, one of the things I love about you is that you're always telling me, yeah, I work 10 to 20 hours. I focus on the, you know, highest, uh, most productive things I can do. I mean, what was the biggest thing you had to realize in order to get more time back in your life? So I went to, to this three-year course that we met every quarter, and I got to give credit for credit to a guy named Dan Sullivan. Uh, I'm real big on continual learning, as you can tell. I mean, I, I spent, they say I spent way too much money. I spent a lot of money on going to courses and being coached and different things. Uh, but I know I don't know what I don't know. But anyway, so here's the deal that Dan Sullivan taught me, and, it, it, and that was another aha moment. You know, you can't be great at everything. Instead of trying to work on your weaknesses, surround your people, yourself with people whose strengths complement your weaknesses and take your strengths and leverage those. But so with the systems and leveraging my strengths, I went from working when I before I sold the big firm up in Raleigh, I went from working eighty hundred hour weeks to like thirty five, forty hour weeks. And then when I moved down to the beach after I sold out, I started another law firm after about two years, three years. It was just a disability practice because I didn't want a license in South Carolina. And to be honest with you, I just did not have the the, the drive or the or the or, or the inclination to want to go study for another bar exam after being out of law school over thirty three years. I right. just, you know, I just taking tests is not one of my strengths either, um, especially.
especially uh, uh, the long of choice. I'm terrible at it. I'm a pretty good writer. I, I can write the essays, but uh, the multi-state like to keep me from being a lawyer, to be honest with you, because it's just it's too tricky. I always have two right answers, which one's the best, and I just yeah. I, I overthink it every time. <laughs> you know? And so uh, we did that, and I wanted something, uh, because I, I started Pilma, which is Personal Injury Lawyers Mark and Man Association, so nobody was there to kind of teach me, so I created this whole association. And we go out and we we, we uh, put on teleseminars, I do a magazine and a newsletter, we put on events, we do uh, webinars, do coaching, and so I try to give them what you know, the stuff I did not have, I had to learn the hard way. And so but I wanted a lab, sort of like a lab in the, to kind of I like to experiment. I like to try new things. And so we we did. And we started this. And I play with a lot of different things, especially Facebook ads. Um, uh, we, of course, we had a blog. We actually, I just, before I sold it, I, I cut an infomercial and had a system set up with all yeah, the way responders. Way and uh, it, I, killed, it killed it. I mean, it really murdered it. I mean, I was getting social security cases for fifty dollars a piece. Uh, I'm talking leads. I'm talking cases. I was, uh, the leads, uh, uh, probably two or three bucks. I mean, it was that, you know, five bucks. But it was just a remarkable. That's something that you know. I like to think outside the box. That's my strength. I'm an idea guy. When it comes to implementing, I usually have to hire people that are what more detail-oriented right. than I am because I tend to, and I tend to get very bored very, very easily. So, you know, I want to try something new, try to figure out a new way to do something or a better way or a cheaper way or a more efficient way or just a whole new strategy on how to get somebody to pick up the phone and call me to hire me. Um, so. Okay, so just so we're not kind of like painting this all as sort of rainbows and butterflies and happy good practice where you're only working, you know, a few hours. W when you were really struggling in the beginning, what was the hardest thing you had to realize or go through or figure out and on your road to becoming a success? Okay, there's several lessons. Uh, is <laughs> and one is you've got to pick really good people, and number two is that you can't do it all. But, but number three is, this was my biggest mistake of the whole deal. I went out and borrowed everything I could borrow, and I put it all in advertising, and I forgot or just didn't know that I had to put some money in reserve to hire people and, and build the infrastructure because if you go from taking in 20 cases a month to taking in 200 cases a month, uh, you know, I, I told you I grew from three staff to almost 55. That uh, costs money. And those staff have to have chairs, computers, telephones, office space, insurance. Yeah, can I actually uh, ask you a question there? Because I remember you told me before in one of our earlier conversations, you some, your overhead was something like 300000 a month. Is that right? Yeah, it was. When I sold it, it was $350,000 a month. So. That's incredible. Yeah, and everybody said, how can you do that? Well, it didn't happen overnight. It was a gradual deal. When I left the firm and went over, it started, my overhead was like $8,000 a month, you know? And it just, you know, it's just like a snowball on the top of a mountain. You know, you start out with one like, like a baseball and you start rolling it down the hill and it just starts building up and it gets bigger and bigger. But, you know, it just happens. Gravity just happens. I mean, it just happens because you're, you know, but but really, that not planning for the infrastructure and the overhead almost bankrupt me. I went like six or eight months without getting a paycheck, and uh, if I had planned for it, uh, and now when I talk to lawyers, I, I tell them when it, it was like sometimes a lawyer comes and says, "I got this two million dollar fee, and I want to go throw it all in marketing and grow my practice. I want you to come here and show me how to do it or help me." And, and I go visit them. I said, we got to set up the infrastructure. And they said, well, no, I don't want to do that. I said, well, I'm not going to help you because you're just, 
I'm not gonna put you through that because you're gonna you're gonna kill yourself. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you're gonna you, you, you yeah. have a heart attack or shoot yourself or whatever because it's, it's very depressing. Uh, and you would think it would be happy times if you if your business is growing twenty, thirty, forty, fifty percent a year. You know, you would think that would be just lovely, but it, it, you know, and then in employees, you know, you got to find good managers or good management team, uh, and uh, and back them up even when they make mistakes. And you got to do it gradually. When we first started, I had a girl. I got to wear many hats. You know, I had my first office manager was my office manager, my personal assistant, and my bookkeeper. Um, you know. And then you go in into this, you get larger, then she just can't off snatch and I have just a bookkeeper. You know what I'm saying? Then I have another girl with just my yeah, personal yeah. assistant. But, but you have to grow it. At, at, when you begin a business or a small business, or any kind of business, especially law firms, you got to wear several people who have to wear, you know, at one time. You can't just uh, go in because you don't have the money and you really don't need all that. If you only got 20 employees, you don't need a full time bookkeeper, a full time. Uh, office manager or administrative, you know, administrator. But once you get to a certain stage, depending on what type of price you got, you'll need that. But the deal is you got to grow into it. Um, so. Interesting. Can I uh, ask you a little here about your personal life? You know, um, one of the things that I think is really interesting, I mean, what, what kind of life experiences are you allowed to have that you couldn't when you were struggling to make your practice work? Well, I could, uh, uh, I can go play golf and I don't have to worry about it. You know, I mean, I, I actually mark out. I mean, my most productive times are in the morning, so I block, I block out in the mornings to write and to, you know, read and to look at courses and different things like that. And then in the afternoons, you know, I do stuff like this. I do interviews and I talk to people or either I go play golf or I go, uh, fish and oh, I just go down the beach. I live like two blocks from the, the beach, um, uh, so I can get out and take a stroll. And uh, where I do a lot of my good thinking, sometimes I just take a book, go down there and read it, and for a couple of hours, or I just take a piece of paper or a notepad. I'm trying to figure out something, you know. Uh, before, when I was just working in my business, as the way Michael Gerber says. I was so, uh, as my uncle told my brother, you're, you're so busy working, you can't make it. <laughs> you know, yeah. you, don't have, you, yeah. don't have, you don't have time to think about anything. Um, so, and I used to take, even back, well, after 2002, I would take two or three days and just go off and be by myself and just, if I had something I want to deal with, and I usually go to some water, I like water, it's very common to me, so I'd go do that, you know, whether it be a lake, we had a place down at the uh, Pinehurst that was on a lake, golf course, and my father left yeah. me, so we could fish, and when I had two golf courses, I could play golf. He hated golf, but he, I'd fish with him early in the morning, and then I'd go play golf in the afternoon, you know. But no, it, it wasn't easy. It, it creating the systems was a, a massive, massive undertaking, and it took years, to, and he's still tweaking it every all the time because things, you know, and I and. Another big deal for me is I don't kill the messenger. I think the people that are on the front lines, the guy, the case managers, the secretaries, the paralegals, if you got the right people, they're going to know more about what's really going on with your business than you do. And if you'll ask them, tell me how I can do this better and, 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 and actually try to implement some of the things, they'll be more forthcoming if they come. And, uh, of course, I always just tell people when you've got a problem with something, I love to hear it, but come to me with at least two solutions. Don't just come bitching and groaning and moaning. I want to hear, bring, bring me some solutions. Not just don't be a whiner. You know, yeah, be, yeah. be a fixer too. And, and they they finally bought into it, and that took a while. But uh, and I, I rewarded them. I had a suggestion box and any idea that saved us money or either made us money. I give them points and in a year. Who had the most points got us free vacation completely paid for and second place got like a thousand dollar gift certificate and third place got like that and so we got people involved because we were incentivizing them uh, and we make a big deal out of it you know, when we have our monthly meetings if somebody really came out with a great idea we recognize them because people love to be recognized 
you know, people don't quit because they're not getting paid. They they they, they quit because they're not either because they're about their immediate supervisor or because they don't feel appreciated. That's it's not it's not the money, you know. It's not, I mean, ten percent of the time it might be the money, but most of the time it's not the money. They just don't feel like they're part of something bigger or that they're appreciated or they got a real ass hole for a boss. You know, a micromanager yeah. or something. And I'm not a micromanager. I, I'm I probably you know, my big deal is I like to you know, paint the big picture. I give them a lot of leeway with some parameters, but I just want to get it done. I mean, if you can figure out a way to do it better, I can give them suggestions. But if you got a better way, I don't care. I just want it done. I want it done by this day. Uh, that was my big deal. I, I really help people. And that's another big deal in building the business. you got to hold people accountable. I don't care. And you got to put the bitch marks up there and hold them accountable. Because people will not do any more than, than you demand of them. And that don't mean you got to be a butthole about it. But the deal is... You know, if I put a deadline on somebody, I expect, and they told me they could do it, I expect to do it unless they come to me and tell me and give me a good reason of why they can't. But, to, you know, if you look at really the great leaders like Steve Jobs and, and Gates and all these guys, they're very demanding people. Uh, I, I just try not to be a butt about it, you know. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. But, but, but very, but yet very, Stern about it too. I always say I'm a benevolent dictator. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I'm easy to get along with, but when I when I when we agree on something, there's a book on that too about managing by agreement. If you can't really manage people, you have to manage. When we agree that you're going to do something, then I expect you to do it. I, I don't want excuses. It's like my I work out three days a week with a trainer, and uh, he's got a shirt he wears. And he wears it for me, and no excuses. They don't want to hear about that I didn't get any sleep, or or that I was out singing karaoke the night before, drinking liquor, and I don't hung over. He don't hear all that. He just he says we got a contract. You're supposed to be here at seven thirty in the morning. I expect you to be here, and I expect you, you know, to be sweating when you walk out of here. I like that term, by the way, the benevolent dictator. I'm stealing that. Yeah. <laughs> um. By the way, you know they're um. They're cranking out, you know, something like 40,000 new attorneys every year. A lot of attorneys that I speak with are generally very concerned about the competition. Um, what would you say to somebody who feels like they just have too much competition to be successful at, you know, building a law practice? Good question. Well, I'll say, you know, there's always, uh, there's always room for another good lawyer. I mean, but you got to be, you know, number one, you got to have the, the vision, the desire, and, of course, the ability. I always say, you know, we talk about referrals, and before I ever talk about it, I always say, you know, the first thing, you got to be referral. So the deal is if, if my mother got in a wreck and had her leg amputated or something, would I refer to my law firm? And I would. I had really law lawyers that were better than I were. And trying cases. I mean, I was I was good, but I had great lawyers. <laughs> I mean, I had people that were, and that's another that's another key to my success. I have no problem with ego. I mean, I know there's people better at things than I am, and I'm okay with that. Um, you know, um, so, but but yeah, I mean, the deal is you got to find. I think that and what there's a lot of things going on now, and it is tough, and it depends on whether you want to go work for somebody or whether you want to be your own boss. But what I find a lot of lawyers do is they want to be their own boss, but they end up really all they got is a job, and then the last one gets paid. Um, yeah, definitely. You know, you know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. And that's not a good place to be. I mean, if you're going to do that, you might as well just go work for somebody and not have all the stress. But uh, And I'm that way. I've never liked working for other people. I, I, I did it when I was younger growing up. I worked, you know, I was a butcher. I worked in the back of fields. I delivered newspapers. I'm not talking on my bicycle. I had a Volkswagen that lived like 400 papers at one point when I was in high school and college. And I had two jobs because I was brought up with that work ethic. But, uh, you know, you got to figure out a niche and you got to differentiate yourself. And you got to, you know, you got to have a passion. Now, here's, here's what I've always told all my children, and then I'm a lawyer, so I'm fine with that. 
find something you got a passion for, and I'll figure out how to make money at it. But if you don't have the passion for it, if you look at all the real great successful businesses, it really won't about the money for them. They just had a really great passion for it. Now, they made a lot of money. They like the money because money gives you freedom, and it's a measuring stick, you know. But the deal is, uh, when you get up in the morning, if you dread going to, whether it's your business or your job, and I tell my people, you know, I tell my people that work for me, if that happens, come to me and I'll, I'll keep paying you and I'll have to find another job because I don't want you miserable because you're not going to do good to pay you or yourself. I want you to have a passion when you come in. I want you to be happy. And I want my children to be that way. And I think everybody should be that way. And a lot of people are not. A lot of people are miserable uh, working for the man or miserable in their own business. Uh, you know, I, I, I figure out real quick that I had a real passion for helping people that that were getting screwed over by the big corporations. I love to take something. I always I used to like to take their sword that they were beating my client up with and take it and stick it up their butt, twist it. <laughs> you know, but that guy, I got off on that. I had a passion for it, and I had a real right. passion for treating people. And if you hear me talk, I don't talk like a lawyer. I had a real passion for not being a big legalese guy. I wanted to talk to them in plain English. I wanted to have a different law firm where they weren't scared of us and they didn't think we were buttholes or arrogant. I mean, I fired lawyers because they talked down the clients. I will not have it. They're the ones that pay our bills, you know. Um, and if they're that bad, then we'll just fire them. But, but you know, uh, the client. Yeah. You know, I had to fire clients sometimes too. That took a long time to figure out too. Can, because, especially when can I actually younger. ask you a specific question on that? Excuse me. Well, well, you got well. You hit on that point. Can I ask you a specific question on that? Sure. Um, you know, so one of the things I hear so many attorneys feel like they always get the crazy, unreasonable, demanding clients. And one of the awesome things I remember last time uh, we talked about it, you've managed to sort of streamline your marketing process. You're you're dealing with better clients. Um, yeah. What would you say? What what's le- what's the number one thing you've done to improve? Not just you know the the money in getting clients, but the actual type of client that walks through the door. What have you done to sort of achieve that? A couple of things. Number one is is I'm really big on educational based marketing, and so I usually get the person, and I try to gear my marketing. Uh, there, there's two types of marketing. I mean, well, there's lots of different types, but for injury lawyers, I call it the speed and greed, and it works very well. You know, so the you, you guy that's got, you got the big checks, and they say, just that easy, one call, that's all. And hey, it works. I, I know it works. I've got numbers, and I've got a mastermind that guys are doing it, and it works. They get thousands of phone calls a month. But uh, they're, I call it the triggers. And there's a book called by Joe Sugarman called uh, I can't, There's like 30 triggers that make people take action and hire you yeah. or, or make a decision. And uh, I like fear of loss. Uh, so my my ads are, are based on not greed and speed, but fear of loss of not getting something they're entitled to. But they don't want most of my clients. And I ain't gonna say all of them. I still still some of them fall through the crack. But I got most of my clients come in. They're not wanting something for nothing. They're wanting what's just. They want what they're entitled to. They want to look after the family. And they're thinking long term. They're not thinking about. I just want a quick check, you know, or I really didn't get hurt that bad. I mean, we turn away a lot of cases. Uh, I mean, we turn away because I know what I know. Several consultants that go around some of these big firms and they tell me what their percentage is of converting. And ours is a lot less. And the reason was because we were a lot more stickly, sticky about who we uh, let hire us. Because I, you know, and then sometimes they still get in there and they worry you to death and call you ten times a day. And I remember telling you this: I just had a conversation with them, you know, uh, and very nicely. You know, you can't do this, and here's the reason why: I can't work on your case or anybody else's case. And although your case is important to me. I can't get anything done from from taking your phone calls. Not that I don't want to talk to you, but we've got a program. 
we call every client every 45 days. Sometimes different that's the Social Security uh, PIs every 30 days. So we're checking with them. Um, so, you know, if you can't stop it, then I can't meet your expectations, and we're going to have to part ways now as friends because we're going to part ways as enemies, and I don't want that. And 80% of the time, they'll straighten up, and 20% of the time, they'll get the file, and that's okay. But, you know, I mean, because drives my paralegals crazy, and then they drive me crazy, you know, moaning and groaning about it, which they should. And another thing, I won't let a client cuss at one of my paralegals. If, if they, if I get the deal that they cussed at them or whatever, I call it, you know, or I get my office manager to call them and tell them they got to apologize. They can't, if they can get the file. It's all about, we, we got to treat, treat them with respect and they got to treat us with respect. And, and then here's the way I've always felt about it. The way you treat your employees is the way your employees are going to treat your clients. I really believe that. If you got it, curses and raises hell, those things, disrespectful then to you, to your staff, then I think your staff's going to pick up on that and they're going to think it's okay to do it. It's like kids. They, they follow yeah, my definitely. example. You know what I mean? Definitely. You know, you see that commercial where the dads are beating up and the kids sitting there watching it, and, you know, they're going to grow up and do the same thing because dad did it. That's what you got to be careful of. I really believe that. You know, and I had nothing to back it up other than just 33 years of doing business. That's uh, really uh, just the golden rule more than anything. It is. And that's kind of, that's one of my uh, values. You know, we're real big on mission statement, vision, and, and values. And everybody says that's a bunch of mark. I used to think the same thing back in the 80s, maybe even the early 90s, but uh, I, I truly believe that if you, if you don't have values and hire people with the same values, it's not going to work. And if they don't know what your values are, then, you know, how do they know? And if they don't know where you're trying to go, how can they help you get there? And if you don't know where you want to go, how can you make decisions every day? Because once you know where you want to go, you set your goals, you set your vision, then every decision you make every day is is based upon getting that end game, right? Yeah. And it's based on, and then you live about your values. Which is like when our days we tell the clients the truth, even if it hurts us, even if it makes them mad. You know, but the deal is in the long run, everybody knows that. And we've turned down cases and then have those people because they call four lawyers and they all lied to them, told them they had a conflict or they won't take any more cases or this or that. We say, you ain't got a case, <laughs> you know, or you know, yeah. you got a case, but it costs, you know, like, it's going to cost so much to do the case, it's not worth it. Your time will ours. And they'll actually end up sending it to somebody else because if that lawyer tells you the truth, and that's all they really want, come on the truth. The ones that I won't represent, I mean, there's some of them that just want something for nothing, but I don't want that client, you know, because uh, they're headaches. And you can never satisfy them. And they're reasonable. Definitely. Yeah, it's actually really funny because I, I always find it scary that when I do these interviews, uh, Inevitably, it comes to the point where they say, "Oh, I don't take every client," and and I, you know, so often some of the people who contact me are are very struggling attorneys, and it it sounds shocking to them when I when we talk about turning away clients and not taking everyone, and and you know, uh, running it that way is always. It's hard when you're just starting out not to do it. I think I remember those days. It's very hard. It's probably out of everything we talked about today, it's the hardest thing to do. It's can can you hard. just? Uh, Stop for a second and say that again because it kind of cut out for a minute there. I'm not yeah. sure what's going on. We got a little bit of a bad connection right now. Okay. Is it better now? Yeah, okay, go ahead. No, I said that's the hardest hardest thing in the world I remember is, is turning it down a client because, you know, that's, that's a potential, even it might be a 20% chance. It's just it's hard to do when you're young because you don't have any business and you say, well, I got time anyway, but if you can make yourself do it and set up your systems and and do it from the beginning, it, it will save you so many headaches and heartaches and make your life, your personal life, so much easier than you would ever imagine. I mean, I guess that would be the biggest, it's the hardest thing to do and it's the most important thing to do. But it is hard. I'm not going to lie about it. It's hard. I remember it. So I didn't always do it. But every time I took one that I shouldn't take, I, 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 I regretted every darn time. I, re- 
regretted it because it always came back to bite me. Uh, you know, always. I knew better. I knew better. You know. Um, but yeah, so I mean, that's very, very important. It's just so hard. I mean, I, I, I remember. I remember how tough it was. Um, you know, I started out with, I spent my first offer on $2,500 that I had saved up. That's what I started with in 19, in December 1982. I took $2,500 started my first law practice. Never forget it. I never forget those days, that's for sure. No. Um, that's all I've got for questions. I really, really appreciate you giving us your amazing insights, your time, and allowing me to kind of interrogate you a little bit. Uh, I do have one more question. If, if uh, somebody listening would like to find out more information about you, what's the best way for them to reach you and find out more? Yeah. Uh, uh, Ken, K-E-N, at Pilma, that's P is a ball, I-L, him as a man, him as a man, A dot O-R-G, or Kenneth dot org is uh, the best way to, to get a hold of me. Yeah, that's awesome, Ken. Uh, really appreciate this interview. Thanks again for your... Well, thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.